Good morning, everyone. It's, it's great to see everybody. Um, stand in front of anyone. Uh, in May of this year, President Ryan announced uh, our desire to form a new institute of democracy at the university that would bring together all of the great centers that study different parts of our democratic system and democratic systems around the world and to make UVA what it was intended to be, uh, the greatest place in the world to study and teach democracy. That's what our founder Thomas Jefferson and his two other presidents, James Madison and James Monroe wanted and we are still committed to that vision at the university. And today we're really lucky to have a discussion amongst the leaders of the university who already are following through on that mission and who are working collaboratively to build that institute. Um, and the timing it couldn't be better or worse. Uh, half of Americans in a recent poll don't trust the outcome of our next election. Uh, this is a sober moment in America where we are politically divided, um, where our media is not trusted, where basic understanding of the rule of law is challenged and viewed in different uh, ways across the political spectrum, where public service has often been denigrated, and where democracies from the local level to the national and the global are under threat and in many places are sliding toward authoritarianism. What is our role in that? It's what it was at our founding, research, teaching, and public engagement. And the people on this stage today are leading that effort for us here at the university. The Institute of Democracy will be a collaborative effort that will bring together all of these units. Each of them will keep their own distinct identity because they come from different disciplines with different focus areas. But we will collaborate on common projects and common activities. And as a graduate of the university and as a student of one of the people on this stage, uh, I couldn't be more delighted about that. <laughs> So who's on stage here? Let's, I'll start with our moderator, Mary Kate Carey, uh, who was a, a near classmate of mine as an undergraduate. She's a professor of practice in the College of Arts and Sciences, where she teaches speech writing. She is also now, and I'm not going to do the full bios, you have them in your program, but the program doesn't mention that she is now, uh, again, a senior fellow at the Miller Center. So I'm happy to have uh, my uh, co-alum and, uh, and colleague at the Miller Center leading this discussion. Uh, to her left and your right um, is Melody Barnes, who is a professor of practice at the Miller Center and works with the College of Arts and Sciences uh, on developing the college's democracy initiative. Uh, she is a professor of practice because she has practiced at the high, highest level, having been domestic policy advisor to President Obama, having worked for Senator Kerry on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, and she brings an enormous range of talents and skills, despite the fact that she went to a state university to our south. <laughs> <clears throat> she was rooting for the right team in April, because the other team wasn't playing in April. <laughs> I was so there. <laughs> to her left is Micah. She sits with me at the Carolina game, so I have, all is fair, and she's willing to do that. To her left is uh, Micah Schwartzman who is the director of the Carr Center uh, for Law and Democracy at the uh, School of Law here at UVA. He is also a graduate of the college and came back and uh, got his law degree here after winning a Rhodes Scholarship and uh, being at Oxford. He's a graduate of the Honors Program in the Department of Politics, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about. And the new Carr Center for Law and Democracy will study a range of issues uh, from the rule of law to freedom of speech uh, and it's a very exciting new venture that um, we're thrilled to have. Ian Solomon, to his left, is the new dean at the Batten School. Uh, been doing it for, what, five weeks now? <laughs> Six weeks? Um, Ian also has extraordinary practice and academic background. He's worked in the Senate, he's worked in the Treasury Department, and as the U.S. representative to the World Bank. Um, he's worked at Yale Law School, and he is an extraordinary addition to our team, and we're thrilled to have him with us. To his left is the first of two Larrys, Larry Terry, uh, who is the director of the right, Weldon Larry Cooper Carl. Center, which uh, you may also know the Sorensen Institute is nested within the Weldon Cooper Center. Uh, and those two undertakings, which are well known, also include a number of other undertakings. They do a series of studies and research from, uh, from survey research to demographic research 
to, through Sorensen, teaching public service and Larry's desires to bring his own background and experience in public service at the local and state level uh, to these enterprises, and we're thrilled to have him. And then finally, uh, the Larry that we all know. Uh, Elvis is in the building today. Uh, your program <laughs> don't have him in the program because we were lucky to, uh, to uh, bring him here, but when he saw that you all would be here, he said, I have to come. Um, Larry is the Robert Kent Gooch <laughs> Professor of Politics, and I'll talk about Robert Kent Gooch in a second. Uh, he is the director of the Center for Politics, uh, where uh, you probably know the Center for its great work on campaigns and elections, including the Crystal Ball, but it does a huge range of civic engagements and civic education programs, both for students at the university and a range of students. Um, Larry is also a graduate of the Honors Program which Robert Kent Gooch started. Robert Kent Gooch was a Rhodes Scholar, graduate of the university who came back here, lived in a particular pavilion on the lawn, uh, which Larry now lives in. And he founded the honors program in the college, uh, in the politics department, to model the tutorials at Oxford. It is a uh, extraordinary program. I don't just say that because I graduated from the program myself. Larry dragged me into it, convincing me that politics is a good thing, and I'm still trying to see if that's true in this well, panel. Well, you were a yeah. good student, and so was <laughs> Micah. It's scary, really. Um, and the reason that I mention it is that the honors program just uh, launched a mini campaign uh, to endow the program. The program is a, a terrific focus of research resources on just a few number of students, only six or seven students a year are admitted to it, and they each get a tutorial uh, with a leading faculty member. Uh, that is an expensive undertaking and is a little hard to justify unless you endow it. And, uh, and fortunately, through a campaign of alumni of the program, we were able to endow the honors program this year. So uh, <coughs> I know that one other graduate of the program, Richard Marks, is in the audience. There may be others as well. And I just want to congratulate and thank you all for doing that kind of work for the university. Larry is the Robert Kent Gooch professor. If there are any professors here that you want to endow chairs in the name of, please do so. Um, <laughs> and so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Professor Mary Kate Carey. Thank you, Bill. So it was just about this time last year, another month or so, um, that I was involved with the round-the-clock uh, international coverage of the state funeral of President George H.W. Bush. And as I sat on many of these panels as the different um, ceremonies took place, one thing that kept getting brought up uh, was other commentators saying that George Bush's death uh, signified the death of bipartisanship, of civility, uh, that the old school was now completely gone, and that politics these days is just completely broken, and that, that his death signified the end of bipartisanship. And I really pushed back on that. And I think President Bush would have pushed back as well. And the reason is, you know, don't get me wrong, I think President and Mrs. Bush were extremely alarmed every time they turned on the television <laughs> to see the nightly news as many of us are on both sides of the aisle uh, with what's going on in Washington. But what I, what I said then, and I continue to say to young people, is that politics wasn't always this way. And it doesn't have to stay this way. And all it takes is good people to come forward and say that they want to make a difference. Uh, George Bush believed that politics is a noble calling and public service is a noble calling and that politics is a way to serve the public. And so when I talk to young people, that's what I say to them, is this doesn't have to be the end. His death was not the end. It could be a beginning. And, and so as we come together this morning to talk about the work that the university is doing to strengthen our democracy, these are good people who have decided that they want to make a difference, just as George Bush did. And so we, we want to talk to them this morning about what they're doing, what some of their colleagues are doing. The good news is they all have friends who are doing good things too, uh, who are scholars and researchers and teachers uh, and public servants. And so I thought we could start with some, something fun after this horrible week we had this week in Washington and all the craziness that was going on up there. Uh, why don't we start with a, a nice question about what is making you hopeful 
about the work you're doing for our democracy. So <laughs> bring us some hope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that was not supposed to be funny. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Mary Kate, and it's great to be here with you and, and my colleagues and all of you this morning. When I was thinking about this question, this is what popped to mind, two things. One, how many of you all have seen or listened to endlessly the soundtrack to Hamilton, the musical? Okay, great. So you remember there is the second cabinet scene and Jefferson and Hamilton are going back and forth in front of Washington. And Jefferson concludes with, if you don't know, now you know, Mr. President. Which actually he was borrowing from hip hop and the notorious B.I.G., mm -hmm. if we are to all be honest about what was happening there. And he, he claims that. But the reason that comes to mind is because if we didn't know that government mattered, now we know. If you didn't know that your vote mattered, now you know. If you didn't know that economic insecurity was sitting underneath of, and bubbling and leading to intense friction, now you know. If you didn't know that there was a sense that there's a hierarchy of human value and that was leading to grave distrust and anger, now we know. And that's important and that wake up call is important and though it doesn't sound like something that might give you hope, it gives me hope because we can't solve a problem if we don't acknowledge it, if we don't recognize it, you can't find a cure unless you acknowledge and see that there is a disease. And I feel as though this moment has led to a wake up call when you talk to students and you engage with people across communities, there is a sense of, wow, the curtains have been pulled back. I've got to get involved. I have to do something about it. You were talking about good people being involved. Now I feel as though there's a sense that crisscrosses the university, the community, the country, and indeed the world, where people are saying we have to come together and address these issues that are undermining our civic culture and undermining democratic principles and our, and our democratic cultural health. So I am hopeful because people now know. The second thing that I think about when I think about hope is the fact that there is a commitment to this issue at this university that is far and above what I've seen in other places. One of the things that we did um, as we were building and starting to build the Democracy Initiative is a landscape review of what's going on, not only across the country, but around the world. And yes, there are universities that are looking at this issue, but not as comprehensively, not in, interdisciplinary, in an interdisciplinary manner, and not with the kinds of assets that you see represented on the stage and beyond. This is a priority for the president of this university and the provost. They speak about it. It's in our strategic plan. And when you talk to the deans of schools, some of them who are here, and of faculty, when you talk to students, people are all in on doing something so that the University of Virginia can be a model, can be a leader on this issue. And that gives me hope. That's good. Oh. I'm hopeful now. <laughs> Micah? I'm, I'm hopeful too. Uh, so I'm here as the representative uh, of the uh, Carr Center for Law and Democracy, and I suppose also uh, on, on behalf of the law school. Uh, the Carr Center was founded a year ago, and you, you made me think when you mentioned uh, the funeral of the first President Bush, what was happening a year ago. We were also dodging a hurricane. That's hurricane right. Florence was coming through, and, and we were inaugurating the Carr Center. Uh, and I, uh, Justice Kennedy was here uh, with us uh, to, to lead off the center, uh, which is about uh, a study of, of democratic norms, of, of respect for the ideals of a pluralistic society, um, the importance of civil discourse, uh, the, the salience now, especially of um, ethics and integrity and public office and, of course, respect for the rule of law. Those are the tenets that we're thinking about inside the Karsh Center, and I just want to recognize that um, Martha and Bruce Karsh are, are here and have gener generously supported this project. Um, when you asked about hope, I, th I thought also two things. One is that we have, um, we have old and durable uh, legal institutions which help to channel our politics. And I think at the moment you, you can conceive of, of our um, political circumstances as a kind of stress test on those political and legal institutions. Um, but I'm optimistic about their stability and their um, ability to respond to that test to help 
uh, provide procedures and constitutional mechanisms that will allow uh, our political conflicts to sort themselves through. It's true that we need people to step up and to participate in those processes, um, but the processes are important, and, uh, and although they are being tested, I, I think we're also seeing their uh, resilience, which suggests the second thing that makes me hopeful, which is <clears throat> that there is a rallying or mobilization around shoring up those uh, legal principles, the constitutional traditions, and the, the norms that are really fun fundamental to our political system. And I think of the Carr Center in some ways as reflecting that. People are concerned about uh, the, the maintenance of these um, principles and of these institutions, and we're, we're seeing uh, an outpouring of support and of new projects and of new efforts uh, to, to maintain and improve and, and in some cases restore uh, those, those mechanisms and those institutions. And we're gonna do that collectively and through a collaborative process. And just to give you one example that's related to the Carr Center, uh, we, we have two new chairs in the center. One of them is a colleague of mine named Mike Gilbert, um, who studies uh, campaign finance and disclosure and bribery. And he's part of something called the Corruption Lab, which studies <laughs> corruption instead of engages in it. We're not, we're not. <laughs> yeah. um, it's about ethics and accountability in public office, and it brings together economists and political scientists and anthropologists and lawyers, and it's working through uh, the Democracy Initiative, which, which Melody um, currently directs, and, and it's an example of collaboration across the disciplines between the schools, right? not just the college, but also the law school. Um, all of these scholars coming together to, to study a phenomenon which we're now all too familiar with, <laughs> uh, but the, the problem of corruption in our political system. And I, I think it's just one really excellent example of how this collaboration is gonna work going forward. So I'm hopeful for, for all those reasons. That's great. Ian, is the Batten School hopeful? Very hopeful. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be, right? That's the rule, sir. No, so <clears throat> this panel makes me hopeful. I was talking with, with, with Bob, Bob, right? Um, he was here from 1968 to 1972, and he was remarking on just who's on this panel in terms of race and gender and differences of experience and background and thought. And that's a very hopeful sign for this university. Yeah. I look out here at this group. I see the students in the front row. That gives me lots of hope. And I try to maintain my hope by taking a longer view of history, which is sometimes hard for us. I think we focus on things, and I can just focus on my time in the Obama administration, yes, it's hard to have hope at that vantage point. But if I look back to previous times in history, you know, nothing's more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory, it's been told. Right? Things weren't that good in the past. Our democracy is not some beautiful, let's all romanticize this past of our democracy being wonderful and now it's suddenly problematic. No. Mm -hmm. This has been a struggle for a long time. Mm -hmm. So the past wasn't as bad as we sometimes, the past was not as good as we sometimes romanticize it. The present may not be as bad as some of the things that, that Melody and Micah talked about, right? Democracy was not supposed to be a place for complacency. I think we've been rocked out of complacency. Democracy is not a spectator sport. Where we think we can just let people somewhere else solve our problems. No, it's a participatory engagement. Um, the revealing certain deep cleavages that still exist in the society and pains and wounds that have not been healed is a very positive thing for us if we want to improve the quality of our democracy. So past is not as good, the present may not be as bad, and the future is up to us. Right? We're not victims of our democratic moment. We are participants and agents in deciding where we're gonna go. And that's why this panel is so great, that's why I'm excited to be at the Batten School, because how do we take this moment, realize this future is up to us, and empower the students who are here, empower the community here, to be agents of the, the democracy that we want one that's more inclusive, one that's more participatory, one that takes the values that I think we all look back at, or at least we believe under, underpin this, you know, the, the best features of our democracy, and put them into practice. So that's what gives me hope. Great. Um, Larry, tell us what's giving you hope in your work. Um, well, I, I begin hopeful on this panel because, Melody, anytime you can <laughs> bring Notorious B.I.G. to a democracy <laughs> discussion. <laughs> That's a good start. Um, gets me excited, so I'm hopeful for that. Um, I want to highlight it in sort of through two lenses or two concepts that I think are important, not only for me personally, but I think for the Weldon Cooper Center um, moving forward. The first concept, I think, is citizenship. And uh, I'll dig a little bit deeper into that because it has 
uh, almost very little to do with uh, the debate behind citizenship as we uh, sort of look at it now. Uh, and the second concept is of community. Uh, with respect to the first, uh, and this probably builds a lot on what you're saying, there's a book by an author named Benjamin Barber. Uh, he wrote it in 1983, I believe. It's called Strong Democracy. And in his argument, he creates a spectrum of what particip participation in democracy is about. On the weak end of participation, he says, you participate through voting. And that that act of voting is the weakest form of participation that you can actually engage in. And many times we assume that our citizenship aligns ourselves in the act of voting. So every four years or every two years, wherever it happens, uh, I always laugh and I, you know, when you see on social media when people go, they vote, they put the sticker on, that says, I voted, they take the selfie, and then they're off, right? So it's almost rewarding yourself for the vote, but my question is always, well, what else are you going to do? After the last election at the previous university I was at, um, there were a number of students who were very upset by the outcome, and I said, you can be upset that the, uh, that the election didn't go in the way that you wanted it to, but what else can you now do as a citizen to try to improve this country, your community? And so taking this perspective that I, as a citizen, have a greater role than just the vote is important. And so for us at the, at the Cooper Center, I think it's, it's particularly interesting that we want to take and cultivate leadership that looks beyond this notion of simply voting, but takes a, a, a deeper dive into how do we create leaders who want to take an active role in citizenship to help their communities every single day. One of our programs is called the uh, High School Leadership Program within the Sorensen Institute for Political Leadership. They come here uh, to UVA, and for two weeks during the summer, they're given an experience of citizenship that shows them how to engage in the political process, how to engage in debate with one another, but based on the values of trust, civility, and respect. And so it's at this very young age that we're trying to capture that imagination and that attention that your role as a citizen begins right now. You don't need to wait until you're, you're donned a fancy title. You can actually engage in that right now. So being a better citizen is something that should matter to all of us. Yes, we vote, but there's other things that we can do. Um, so through that kind of work makes me, makes me hopeful. <coughs> and the, the second concept I mentioned was that of community and something that we promote within the Cooper Center. Uh, I think that community in of itself as a concept has binds to commonalities. So what are the things that we actually have in common that we can advance on as opposed to a simple justification that I am, I vote this way or I vote that way, I'm from this colored state versus that color state. How do we look at things uh, in a collective fashion? Affordable housing is a problem for everyone. It's not a Democratic issue, it's not a Republican issue. Transportation is a problem for everyone. So if we can take that approach through our legislation, through our policy, through our activity, uh, and that is a lot of the work that we are trying to accomplish within the Cooper Center is how do we place community at the center of our democratic thought and try to bridge and be productive in that way. So um, uh, there's a lot of that happening uh, sort of where we work and I see that that's happening here in terms of perspective and thought. So those are the things that, that give me hope and, and uh, as you mentioned, Dean Solomon, democracy probably shouldn't be very easy or else if everything were one way, we'd probably have a problem and it wouldn't be democratic. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, it, it comes down to a question of what are you willing to advocate and potentially fight for based on the values that you believe to be true? And so that's sort of what gives me hope and something that gets me up uh, to go to work every single day, so. That's great. That's what we work on in my political speech writing class is how do you get people off the couch? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. how do you get them to mm -hmm. move? Um, so uh, the people in the back of the room might not be able to see that uh, Professor Sabato's button there is deeply hopeful, and it says Nixon is the one. Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, take it away there. <laughs> yes, and I, I balance it with Senator John O. Pastore, the Democrat of Rhode Island, 
who was the very first Italian-American elected to the U.S. Senate in honor of Columbus Day. And, and I'm with it. I celebrate Columbus Day until noon because I'm Italian-American, and the rest of the day is Indigenous Peoples Day. So I try and balance. It's called uh, fair and balanced. Somebody, <laughs> somebody ought to use that slogan uh, and mean it. Um, well, look, I, uh, we were kidding ahead of time. Mary Kate was great, and she said, uh, uh, you know, you're the most senior person on this panel. Uh, and I said, yes, I am the oldest. Uh, that's absolutely, absolutely <laughs> correct. As of next year, I will have been here for 50 years. I've seen a lot of changes at the University of Virginia. Uh, almost all, not all, but almost all of them good. This is a much better university than it used to be. And that's not to criticize anybody here who was at the University of Virginia in prior times because you helped to create the better university. You have given, you have uh, volunteered, you have tried to bring good students and good faculty here, and it's worked. We, we have a much better university. It's a nationally ranked university, an internationally known university, and looking at individual departments and all the rest of it, uh, I'm just very, very proud of it. I've always been proud of it. I've always been. I'm, I'm a greedy person. I want the University of Virginia to win everything <laughs> all the time in every single category. So last night. Uh, what's that? So last night hurt. Last night, well, I don't, I don't remember last night. Okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> that's what makes me optimistic. Okay. <laughs> my, my memory's fading. So, and I just hear a lot of you are like that. You put out of your mind anything you don't want to remember, and it works. As the older you get, the more it works. Uh, Mary Kate, when you asked us about being hopeful yes. and optimistic, and you all did a great job, so you've covered the optimism. I, when I first heard that, I thought. I'm not hopeful at all uh, because so many things have gone wrong and also because stage of life and I could looking out there and don't lie I can see quite a few of you are in my category or older and so things are dark and eventually very soon they're going to be dark for all eternity so <laughs> that <laughs> to be hopeful wow okay? thanks for now. coming everyone <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm getting to something more optimistic. Now. Give me a chance. Give me a chance. Uh, but then, then I, then I, I snap out of it because mornings are. I've always been depressed in mornings. So I, you know, if I ever retire, I'm going to eliminate mornings and just start, start like the lawn students do at noon. Um, but I'll tell you why I, I am optimistic. One is a very positive thing, and a number of you have already mentioned this. You really can't be a pessimist if you're a teacher at any level because you encounter every day young people who are determined uh, to do well themselves but to make society better, to make the world better. And they, they really care and they're, they're willing to devote lots of time and energy to it. And it's infectious. And so that's the great thing about being a teacher anywhere, but I think particularly at the University of Virginia, again, I'm biased, I think we have some of the very best students in the world, easily the best students in the world. Uh, so that's one reason why I'm hopeful. I think they'll turn some of this around. Now, politically, if you're gonna get into the nitty gritty, uh, and I'm not gonna mention his name, I'm simply going to say that I think this is an aberrational moment. I, I really do believe it's an aberrational moment. Uh, I'm not talking so much about the issues. You can I argue issues all day, all night. I'm used to that. You know, that's been my lifetime and your lifetime, arguing about the substance, the issues, the policies, and you can come from many different perspectives. It's the nastiness, the viciousness, the words that are used to hurt, not just by the leaders, although they set a horrible example. <laughs> It's also the rank and file on social media, which has been a blessing and a curse. Uh, it's what they say on Twitter and Facebook and all the rest of it. But it, it can't last because, frankly, society can't hold together if we continue down this path. We just can't do it. So I, I did, I, I told you about the past story. Now, what, what in the heck am I doing with this Nixon's the one button since I, I worked for George McGovern? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. And I'll tell you something, I'm still proud of D.C. and, the, and uh, Massachusetts. They, uh, they did a great job. 
And if I'd only heard those two returns, I would have gone to sleep happy. Uh, but it, it, in retrospect, uh, he was, in many respects, a, a pretty good president, very smart. He actually knew government. He actually knew policy. So I wore this because I thought it would bring us together. Because number one, Democrats now think a lot better of Nixon because of the incumbent uh, who's in there now. Everybody looks better. William Henry Harrison's month looks great. <laughs> he didn't make any mistakes. But, but also, in addition to that, uh, Nixon was the one. He was behind the unconstitutional, talk about a coup, the unconstitutional meanderings of that administration that resulted in his resignation. So this should bring everybody together. Whether you loved him or hated him, Nixon was the one. He really was the one. So there are ways to bring people together, odd ways. This is very odd. Uh, but you're allowed to be eccentric after a certain age, right? So that, that excuses me. Now look, I've got a, everybody gave a advertisement, I have to give one too. Here's another reason why I'm optimistic. At the Center for Politics, we exist for civic education and civic participation, especially among the young, but, but everybody. And we produce every year one or more documentaries. We've got a three-parter on democracy and how we can save it because it is declining, not here, not just here, but around the world for lots of different reasons. We have to save it. And so this series will suggest some, some ways that we can do it. And uh, that was to make up for the really depressing one we had last year, which won an Emmy. We have four. Uh, it's really become old hat. Uh, and I, I, you know, I sleep with one of them, because uh, we don't need all four there. But uh, it was on Charlottesville, what happened in August of 2017, which I, I will never forget because of how horrible it was not just downtown, but also on the lawn the night before. So, uh, but our key program, our biggest program, is something called the Youth Leadership Initiative. And we decided, I'm not giving up on older people. You know, that's what documentaries are for and other means of education. But young people really are the ones who need to learn the basics of our system, the fundamentals. They need to learn about civics because it's being eliminated in lots of schools. It's an expensive subject to teach and incredibly in lots of places it's considered optional. It most certainly is not. It ought to be up there with reading, writing, and arithmetic. So what we've done, and we've done it for 20 years now, this was founded in 1998, and what we have done is to go around the country, all 50 states and our territories, see superintendents, see teachers, ask them what they need, use our resources to create the materials that connect with teachers and young people that will teach our fundamentals, teach about voting, teach about candidates, teach about politics. You know, Mike, you think you've got a corruption unit. I mean, think about what I could have at the Center for Politics, and we'd have to have a whole new building just for that. But we need to correct these things, and young people are the ones to do it for the reason I mentioned right in the beginning. And as of Friday, we had one, and this is teacher by teacher, superintendent by superintendent for 20 years. And we have, as of Friday, 119,671 teachers from kindergarten through high school enrolled in our program. We give them everything they need for free and they use it. And over time, this is going to have an effect because people will actually know what's in the Constitution. They'll actually know the fundamentals of our system, how it was founded, how it's changed and gotten better. And so that's what keeps me going, a belief that we can make a big difference, a real difference over time. There. Thank you. OK. <laughs> um, we're going to continue our conversation here for a few more minutes. But uh, I'd like to remind you that if you have questions for our panelists, Sam and Catherine are here in the front row, students, and you can text a question to them. Uh, the number to text to is 530-361-6490. And uh, send in your questions, and in a few minutes, we'll take them from the students. Um, so as we just listened to all the different uh, projects that are going on, Melody, can you enlighten us on how, how the work will be under the umbrella uh, at the university so that we can be the, the go-to place in the nation for strengthening democracy? How will, how will this all come together? 
Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, Larry, I want you to know you're not alone. When I was eight, I sold cupcakes for George McGovern. No kidding. So, <laughs> yeah. Were they good cupcakes? <laughs> they were. Well, that's what. But apparently not good enough. But. <laughs> um, so two things in, in response to your to your question, Mary Kate. One. There's the work of the Democracy Initiative, and then as Bill also described, the work of the Institute of Democracy, which serves as the broader umbrella that connects and knits together the work that we're all doing, even as we continue to push forward in the various uh, programs and centers and initiatives that you all just heard about. So as we continue to build on our strengths under the umbrella of the Institute, there are things that we think that we can do better and that we could only do collectively that we can't do individually. So for example, many of you may have attended the Presidential Ideas Festival last May, which was a product led by the Miller Center, but a product of the collaboration of everyone sitting on the stage. Um, and I think everyone sitting on the stage was on that stage at some point, but the, the thought leadership behind uh, that, that work. In addition to that, there are a number of different ways that we collaborate with one another. So then when you think from my vantage point about the Democracy Initiative, we have four, at this point, four rotating democracy labs. And as Micah mentioned, we've got the anti-corruption lab. Uh, we have another one that focuses on religion, race, and democracy, another that focuses on deliberative media. And, the, and ask a whole range of questions about how social media is at play in our democracy, both here in the United States, but globally. And is there a platform that we could imagine where we could increase and enhance deliberation as opposed to undermining it? And that brings together people from German uh, studies, American studies, Latin American studies, media studies, journalism, psychology. Um, we also have a democratic statecraft lab. You know, the Batten School, the law school, uh, politics are represented there. So we're in all of these labs, we're crisscrossing the university and drawing upon the best of the experts that we have as faculty, but also as students. And we have two projects. One, the Equity Center that was just announced yesterday, if you all saw UVA today. Um, and we're doing that in strong partnership with the law school, but also the School of Architecture and Music uh, and Nursing and Medicine. And that's an opportunity for us to work, not, not just go into the, the Charlottesville community and other communities and say, kind of, you know, we're the university and we're here to help, but to do this in a structure, in a governance structure, with residents of the community to redress issues of inequity that not only exist here, but around the country and around the world. How do we model that? How do we uh, propagate community-engaged scholarship so that we are leaving something behind and showing students how we, how we can work and how we can perform that kind of, of scholarship? And we also have a memory project that looks at cultural memory um, and cultural trauma thinking about the wake of what happened here in August 2017. But again, as many others have said, recognizing that those dots are connected to trends that we are seeing globally. So those are different ways that we are working across the university, but students always sit at the center of this work. So for example, and here's an invitation, I issued this yesterday to some of you. Next Friday, we'll be screening at the Violet Crown Cinema work done by undergraduate and graduate students who are participating in the Religion and Race and Democracy Lab, um, sh documentary shorts that they've done, not only focusing on work here in the United States, but also work around the country, around the, around the globe. So we've got a Jefferson Trust uh, uh, Foundation grant to support undergraduate research. Again, how do we engage students? How do we do this research? How do we work in the broader community? And how do we all work together to do this? Because we are certainly better collectively than we are separately. Um, so you didn't mention Notorious B.I.G. that time. <laughs> I can figure it, I can figure it out later. Okay, okay. Um, so, so Larry, I, um, I would use the word senior. You, you said old, not me. But as the uh, most senior alum uh, on stage here, you've been here the longest. Uh, yes, we got that point. Got that, did I mention that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so how is it that UVA is, what makes us uniquely qualified to do this 
Is this something only UVA can do, or is there any other university in the country could do this? Oh, I wouldn't want to say that we're the only one. Of course, we could do it best and will do it best, but we're not the only one. Some, some other universities would put in inadequate efforts. <laughs> but that's my bias, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, and many of you are, I think almost all of you probably are, are uh, University of Virginia alums, and I hope you feel the same way. But uh, look, we have a complicated history, just like America has a complicated history, right? Thomas Jefferson has a complicated history. Uh, and we've, we've all known it for a long time. I remember one of the first things I saw when I, I came to, to UVA, other than Patty Kyle Epps, I saw her, uh, was, uh, was a broadsheet, I'm sorry, Patty, I, I, I was a broadsheet called the Sally Hemings. This was in 1970. You know, it, it isn't as though this stuff has been a secret. It's just that, that once people knew it, they buried it for one reason or another. And we, we have come to terms with our history in, I think, good ways. And we've got to continue to do it. It's by no means uh, over. Just one little example that, that and I, I kicked myself because uh, the um, a part of the historic preservation efforts at the university uncovered a photo of a beautiful woman who had, uh, African American woman who had a white child on her knee and she was uh, well dressed, she seemed happy and so on. And it turned out that this was one of the slaves of the very first resident of Pavilion 4 where I live on the, on the East Lawn. Uh, and he was a horrible man, I'm sorry. He was an absolutely horrible man. He was the largest slave owner in Charlottesville, Albemarle. He was German. They didn't have slaves, but he came over here and got right into the spirit and, and started buying slaves. He had so many slaves that Jefferson rented them to help build the lawn and the rotunda. Now, why do I bring this up? Because this, this act of discovery, it moved me, it moved lots of people. Not that we haven't been moved about it before, but we're, gonna, we're going to honor her in Pavilion 4. We're going to have her, her photo and everything we know about her. Her name is Lucy Cottrell. Uh, we're going to have all of that in Pavilion 4, and I want it done in all the pavilions. My dear friend Dory Fontaine is, is here. She's leaving as, or I guess is left as, uh, nursing dean, but she's still on the lawn. In case you all wanted to come by and visit her, she's hiding out over there. Uh, she's been trying to keep that from you, but she's right here. Uh, every pavilion should have this. This shouldn't be a plaque uh, on the floor near, near the rotunda. The wonderful enslaved laborers monument that's coming up is, is fantastic. And I hope all of you will come and see it and maybe come to the, to the unveiling of it once it's finally done. We need to come to terms with that history. But it's because we're doing it, Mary Kate, it's because we're doing that, mm -hmm. that we are well positioned to take on this broader issue of how to reconcile our past, which has very good parts and very bad parts, uh, with our intent to progress and get better and to lead the way for others. And we can do it. We will do it. I know this university backwards and forwards. I have complete confidence in it. And I hope every person in this room does too. Um, when I think of a phrase like honor the future, especially now that I'm teaching, my mind immediately goes to the young people in the next generation. Um, so before we start taking questions, um, Ian, why don't we go to you on the, the, the next generation and how, uh, you know, with all the research and labs and that sort of thing uh, aside, what can we do to position young people to uh, strengthen our democracy? Thank you, Mary Kate. And I think that's what draws so many of us to this university and this institution. As someone who's new here, I look at UVA and that's all well and good that it's done good things, and yet we have to own it, right? It is not, it's not a given. There's nothing inevitable that we will be the best at doing this. There's nothing unique, I don't think, to the DNA that says that we, are, we don't do anything. We're going to be the best at democracy. No, this is hard work. This is going to be the work of each of us here and through all of you, ensuring that the decisions we make, the risks we take, the choices we make, the monuments we build, the monuments we uncover, the, the history we, we expose, we've got to do that with real intentionality 
And we can't do it alone. But the energy here among the students to do that is intense and, and, and really exciting. So I see my mission here is how do I cultivate leaders who want to ask these hard questions? How do I you know, fire up their curiosity about, well, what is it about UVA that is special? What is it about UVA that needs to be fixed? Where are the, the wounds that need to be healed? Um, and you know, working across grounds, but as a school that has both undergraduates and graduate students, what does it mean to cultivate a leader? Mm -hmm. right? Many people come up with the idea that a leader is just about the role you have. But no, it's about the choices you make and the skills you cultivate over time. So we work very hard to cultivate those skills, the skills of empathy and self-awareness, skills of compassion and listening to others, the skills of decision-making in situations of real uncertainty and ambiguity, because that's what we're going to need for these complicated, uncharted times, is people with both the, the, the spirit to lead with, with ethics and integrity, um, and also the ability to make hard choices. So I, I think about, uh, you know, I see my colleague, uh, Professor Williams, out there. Right? We think we, the people, in order to form a more perfect union. Well, Brian is, Professor Williams is a project, how do we get to we? Mm -hmm. right, we the people, but how do we, how do we get to we? Right? That's imp a important dialogue we need to have with people we don't always dialogue with. You know, so we do a lot of work going out into the communities to engage people in what does we mean? What is we going to mean in Charlottesville and Albemarle County and here, and here at UVA as we embrace more first generation students, as we want to be a beacon not only for people across the state but also across the country and across the world. So how do we get to we? I think of another project we have with students. Um, we've collected a lot of data through our Center for Effective Lawmaking. At what makes a good lawmaker? Many of our students go work on Capitol Hill for the summer or after they graduate they go work on the Hill. Well, how do we make sure that they actually add value to their offices? So we're collecting data on what makes the best legislators. And we actually have a, a publication here, you know, The Five Habits of Highly Effective Legislators. So we can do trainings for people on the Hill, both staff and members, to make them more effective at advancing their legislative agenda. Right? So let's practically work on it and get feedback and we'll debate them and how do we get the, figure out the data on how you measure effectiveness. Let's have that conversation. I think of that work with another one of my colleagues who does the work on social entrepreneurship. Right, a big part of our democracy is the norms that underlie it and the civic institutions beyond just our, our formal institutions. Where's the nonprofits and, 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 and the way we, we as a community members solve local problems, whatever they may be? Social entrepreneurship is a great mechanism. How do we take our student energy and help them learn how to start organizations, for profit, nonprofit, but based on purpose? Right, and give them the skills they need in coordination with McIntyre on the business and finance side, in cooperation with the law school, across Center for Politics, tie the threads across this institution to really empower students, to be, to be engines for, for empowerment and equity, as I put it. Well, speaking of students, Sam and Catherine, what do you have for us? Thank you. Um, Dean Solomon characterized this time as a political moment in history. Are political moments as exciting as these a necessary part of the democratic process? <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to take that? Well, it's about Ian. OK. Yeah. Go ahead, Ian. <laughs> you said it. You own it. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I think in the moment, they always feel that way. Um, and I look back at many moments in my time, and whether it was you know, moments that give you more hope and optimism, right? You know, my time with Senator Obama, lots of moments there that were big, glorifying moments. But I also spent time, you know, throughout history, it was a Mandela when Mandela got elected in South Africa. So we do have these moments, and I've been happy to live with mostly positive ones, but negative ones too. I think back to, you know, uh, Tale of Two Cities. Right? The best of times and the worst of times. You know, times of memory and not times of forgetting, times of, you know, sp spring of hope and winter of despair. I think our, we always feel like the moments are intense. Um, but I think you can point throughout the history of our country um, to many very significant moments, whether it's around the New Deal or around the Civil War, or around World War II, where we have actually had to come together and make a choice as a people, whether we are, you know, bending the arc of history towards greater justice or away from it. You know, what comes to my mind is um, I remember the fight for the Americans with Disabilities Act being very contentious and a lot of people opposed to it. 
And yet, uh, when it got enacted, it was a bipartisan vote. It was not an executive order. Uh, people had to own it because they had to vote for it. Mm -hmm. And now, looking back on it, it seems like such an easy decision to make, but it wasn't at the time. History can look inevitable sometimes. Yeah. As if you look back, of course these yeah. things would have happened. Of course we would but have. But they happened because students actually, you know, occasionally skipped class, went to, to protest on things, and went to work for people to make things happen. They happened because, you know, beyond Massachusetts and Washington, D.C., right, elections do turn because the participation and activism of, of college students many times in history. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. And I think we often don't know when we're in a moment. Yeah. You know, in Florence, they weren't going, here we are in the Renaissance. I mean, <laughs> right. you, look, <laughs> you, know, you, you look back and recognize those yeah. moments. But I think that speaks to something that several of my colleagues spoke to earlier, the importance of those moments and you know, the story we all know, the phrase we all know, a democracy if, we, if you can keep it. Right. You know, every single day it requires all of us being intentional. There is something to this idea of civic health, the idea of the common good, of civic virtue, and the idea of an engaged and, and educated citizenry because it requires all of us to think about how we engage and build and strengthen and create and realize our democracy and democratic principles. And then that creates, and we can look back and say, ah, this was the moment when we were able to move forward, or this is the moment when we struggled, and how we got through it. Can I add to that yeah. quickly? Um, when I think about this, uh, the term that's now in pop culture that seems to be emerging and used more frequently is the term woke, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? I mean, people's eyes are opening to what's actually happening around them and their willingness to accept and understand that these things that are happening, now you have to do something about it. You can't just go back to sleep. And uh, this week I read a story about the, the mayor of Stockton, California. You may have read this story as well. One of the youngest mayors in the country. Mm -hmm. He's 29 years old. And he started a program where he gave every citizen in the city $500 a month just to see what they would do with it. And he did that in part based on his perception of inequity. Again, his realization that things are not the way that they should be, so let's try something to see how this can be helpful. I don't know when it happened for him, but at 29 years old, he was activated to do something. It's not traditional you see a 29-year-old mayor, but for him to say, I want to do something about it, and I think if I put myself in this space, he certainly had a moment at some point and I'd love to learn more about that, but that is a, a part of this, this idea of, again, being woke, understanding what's happening around you, and understanding and taking these moments to say, if I disagree with this or I think things are not okay, what am I gonna do about it? That was his reaction, that was his answer. And I, one last thing, sorry. Yeah. What is the moment for you is what you need to think of, right? Is it climate change, is it gender equality, is it poverty, is it inequality? Think, what is, make it a moment for yourself. Yeah. Uh, the students this week are studying Bono's 2004 commencement address at Penn, mm -hmm. where he says, how are you going to betray your moment? How are you going to betray the age? And I think it's a great question for the times. Anyway, Catherine, how about a question? Is the growing polarization and partisan divide in America today something that can or should be fixed? And if not, will it be detrimental to our democracy? Go ahead. That, uh, the reason I'm answering this is because just this morning I read what could be interpreted, and I did interpret it that way, as a very depressing study. Pew, Pew Research uh, has been asking for years uh, partisans on both sides and independents, but I'm restricting this right now to Democrats and Republicans because after all, that's 90 plus percent of the population, whether people admit they're Democrats or Republicans or not. They actually, you know, if, they, if you vote nine out of 10 times for a party, you're a member of that party. Call yourselves a hot and tot. I don't care, but you are essentially a member of that party. Anyway, they've been asking for years, uh, how do you feel about the other side? And they give them a feeling thermometer, which some of you in, in polling uh, or government, Jim Todd, are familiar with. And when you get this feeling thermometer, you know, it's uh, one, to, uh, one to 100, and you put that thermometer uh, as cold as you want or as hot as you want uh, to indicate your feelings toward them. Do you feel good toward them or, or uh, bad toward them? 
and we just hit a new high, a horrible high. Uh, Democrat, Democrats now, 79% of them, feel coldly toward Republicans, and the new percentage among very coldly is close to half. And it's way above what it was even four years ago. What about Republicans? 83% of Republicans are in the same category. And the very coldly percentage has also hit an all-time high. Uh, people, and when you look at the other questions, you can see people don't view one another as adversaries or you know, just political foes because we think differently. They literally describe their opposing party members as enemies. Mm. I mean, we are all Americans. And it's great to have vigorous arguments about all these issues, and it's important to have those arguments because these are serious matters, and we need to resolve them, or maybe even, to use a dirty word, compromise. But uh, we can't continue like this. I mean, we just can't continue like this. How can you make a democracy work when everybody hates one another? You have to be able to talk to one another. So my, my belief is, an answer to whoever asked the question, uh, you know, could it continue? Could we continue with this kind of negative partisanship to the point where we have another civil war? Well, the answer is yes, we could, but that's what we all have to work against. If we work against it and we, we work to bring people together even to have vigorous arguments, as long as they don't throw things at one another. That is a good thing. It's our, it's our obligation. It's not just senior leaders' obligation. It's not just teachers in the classroom. It's all of us. We have to do it. It's unpleasant sometimes, but we have to do it. And, and that's, so it, the answer is, it depends on whether we act, whether we do the right thing. And if we don't, we'll fall apart. Yeah. Also, I mean, just building on what Larry was saying, I think I absolutely agree with you. And I think what this um, movement from opponents to enemies has created is an exacerbation of the fracturing of norms that many of us yes. have lived with and seen that sit beside laws, sit beside regulation, but have are unwritten but they are also part of the glue that has held us together. Exactly. And when that starts to fracture, you see what, we're, what we have now, and we have to ask ourselves why. Um, and sitting on two ends, so I guess three books for you. Um, one, this is written about in the book, How Democracies Die. They propose one view on this and one set of solutions to it. And two, um, Arthur Brooks, who was here, and we did this in, par in partnership with the Batten School last year, talks about that kind of anger that leads to contempt. He also, from time to time, partners with John Powell, sitting on the other side of the ideological spectrum at Berkeley and the Haas Institute, who talks about this as othering. And they, all three, uh, write about the ways that we can address these issues and the fact that we have to start to find ways to honestly start to knit ourselves back together and to rebuild new norms. That's exactly right. It is norms. Mm -hmm. It's exactly right. Well, um, there's a tremendous amount of talk in Washington about problems, um, but not a lot about solutions. And it is such a joy to hear solutions and to see the glue uh, starting uh, right here on the stage. And I just want to say thank you to each of you for stepping forward and saying that you want to do something with your life to make this better. And it means the world to a lot of us here. And uh, I just, I want to say thank you. My, my feeling thermometer is very warm, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> just want to say thank you. So, uh, well, it's so, climate change, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for coming today. Thank you for our wonderful That's great. Well, I thought everybody did a great job. I think there's a, a lunch they're all going to.